data coming from the other revolution that's going on right now, the sensor revolution, the replacement of human labor with solid state devices that do many of the counting, monitoring, dial tapping, information flow monitoring tasks that used to be done by human beings, we are in the process of instrumenting every aspect of the real world. We're spread over two floors here at Strata. Um, on the second floor, we've got uh, the data lab where we are right now. This is uh, registration along here, mm -hmm. and we've got some of the breakout rooms here. And then upstairs, uh, we have the, uh, the sponsor pavilion and then the main, the main keynote room. Right, it's a really huge space. Yeah, it's a really big space. You know, I'm really excited because I didn't want Strata. Strata is a great conference. I didn't want it to be just an IT conference, just about the tools and technologies. I wanted it to be interactive and have people engage. Do something that actually says O'Reilly, uh, the kind of things that we do, hands-on make, hands-on hacking, as well as the data applications. We're yep. gonna get this uh, X2E gateway plugged in and that's gonna take care of getting data from all 50 sensors over the mesh network onto the internet, up to iDigi, and across to all the data storage there. And then uh, from iDigi, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull it over to Amazon Web Services. Rob Faludi has led with the iDigi cloud, this kind of collection of transporting this data up into the cloud. All right, we have first light. We have data coming into iDigi, guys. Oh, excellent. Whoa. So the Strata Data Lab is live, at least to the point of iDigi and will soon be uh, feeding, or maybe already is feeding, into the Amazon store as well. Great. That's cool. Excellent news. Now we just have to add um, 49 more sensors. Yeah, so no pressure. So we're going to build them? We, we could build them. We should we do could. that. Alistair Allen's really led the design of the sensor hardware. You know, that, that's one of his big areas of expertise. So he built out prototypes actually three weeks ago on the road at Strata London. He's really led the, uh, the Arduino, the XP, the sensing part of the, the project. So this one's doing pressure, temperature, um, uh, humidity, and light, and the ones we're going to deploy across the rest of the, the center. The actual choice of sensors is, well, it's a bit of a funny story. It comes straight down to the fact that it was whatever we could source in the time frame available. We had about a week ahead of time to do this, and um, the, we had 50 moats, and it's whatever we could find 50 of very quickly. This is one of the production sensors. Um, and what's that got on it? So this has got a slightly different uh, sensor loadout than the prototype. It's got the temperature and humidity from the DHT22 sensor there. It's got a per sensor for motion. Right. And then it's got a, um, a mic for um, electric microphone for uh, dB levels. Oh, great. So that's going to tell us if we're in a noisy room or not. We deliberately chose um, hardware, bits and bobs, off-the-shelf components that you can more or less slot together, especially with most of this now being done in software, and you can grab the software in GitHub, it's all available, along with uh, fritzing diagrams to show you how exactly how to wire it up. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take this prototype here, and we're gonna put it into a software program called fritzing, mm -hmm. which essentially replicates what we're looking at into a diagram on the computer. So we've got three things that are very useful to us. We have our breadboard view, so we see all of the wires, all the connection points, all the components connected properly. The schematic view is a more concise view, and, but the schematic view is useful to see what's connected to what um, in, in an unobstructed way. And then finally, we have our PCB view, and that's the copper circuit board that will get sent off to a circuit board house. And I will get copper-clad uh, fiberglass boards back that I can actually solder to um, and implement my design. So the choice of the, the hardware platform we use, the Arduino, is an absolute no-brainer. It's, it's the obvious thing to choose. In the same way, the, the XB mesh networking, it was perfect for this situation. I think I'd also be interested in seeing uh, if we have directly above us. Oh, yeah, um, and okay. I I'm, I'm guessing that's here. Yep. Um, so maybe in this grand ballroom west, we can uh, put a node there. Um, and see if we can see it directly the from the gateway. The floor is a barrier, but it's not a full barrier. Zigbee is a mesh networking protocol. And what that means is that rather than, well, with Wi-Fi, you're going to have your laptop or maybe your phone talk directly to a base station. So it has to be close enough to that base station to talk to it. Well, in a Zigbee network, the nodes, the individual sensors, don't have to be close enough to the base station to talk to it because they can hop their information through other radios. And that makes it a perfect protocol for distributing a low-power, low-bandwidth network 
all through a building, a huge facility like this one. And what I'm actually going to do now is I'm going to grab um, a couple of the, the prototypes we made up earlier. They're already in the 3D printed cases, which uh, Brian's building up over there. And we're going to do the first deploys now. They're made out of corn or potatoes, uh, depending on where you get the material. It's called polylactic acid. It uh, comes from the earth and it can go back to the earth. It's biodegradable. One of the great things about showing people how this thing is made is that we can show them how a 3D printer actually fabricates something. Because we're using a printer design, the PrinterBot Junior, that's entirely open. Uh, there's no enclosure around it. Basically, it's doing a two-dimensional drawing in, in plastic and then moving up a fraction of a millimeter and doing another drawing on top of that. So the, the range of these sensors is going to be about 30 meters. Um, so because, the mesh, because of the mesh network, which we talked about earlier, we really want to get um, a good coverage coming out from the gateway. So there's lots of routes that back into the gateway. So next to this water cooler, which is uh, about 20 meters from our gateway, is a good place to start. So every time this LED blinks, we're actually sending a data, uh, data packet down through the, um, the XP network. And yeah, so basically I put my hand in the way and we got this LED came on here to detect a motion. And it's going off. So if I do this again, there you go. Comes on, it comes on and it'll, it has a timeout value of roughly three to 10 seconds. So I'm just going to check the associate, association light on that is good. So that's actually on the network. Hey, it looks like we have another sensor. So yep. we can see this is our, our new sensor here, the one that starts uh, uh, 2AAB. Yep. And it's got temperature. It's got PER, which uh, is going to be passive infrared. That's that motion detector. Yep. And then, um, that, then there's actually... And we can see it's actually gone from 1 to 0, which yep. means that it's gone from seeing motion to not... Or, from seeing motion to not seeing motion and back to seeing motion again. Yep, and then if you see the click on this one, this is, should be going from one to minus one. Uh, yeah, yes. there we go. This, so, so we if have you just pull this up here. here. All right. So we can actually just see. So this is actually a start of motion detected yep. and then end of motion detected. And the so. end. And then we should also be seeing some temperature. This is obviously just a few data samples. Yep. Uh, the microphone is telling us how much uh, loudness we have. With so many variables in the data set, we're going to have to start just charting it out and looking at it visually to see what appears to have a correlation. Data visualization is going to become a big part of our day-to-day -day lives. We're already seeing it in newspapers and journals, and that level of literacy, visual literacy, is starting to increase. So you come from the data visualization side, and I'm curious about what, as we're talking about this, what kind of visions are filling your head in terms of how you would tell these stories? Usually what kind of graphs you would make? You know, I think it's easy to start in sort of a map format because that's something, the spatial stuff is always sort of the easiest quick hit because that's how we all think. Yeah. You could see each dot here represents a different moat that's located throughout the conference. And the size of the dot corresponds to how much traffic was flowing by that spot at any particular time. And the color denotes the, the mic level. So if it's a, a darker color, it's very loud at that location. Around 8 a.m., the talks are starting again, the keynotes. So you can see that traffic and, and mic levels start to pick up again. Uh, I can also look at spark lines for, to track the humidity levels in the space and also the temperature. So it's interesting to see where the spikes are happening and which rooms and when. So the data came up from the sensors on site. It went up into the iDigi middleware solution. And from there, we registered using their web services interface to receive push notifications when new data was available. That came up into uh, an application that was running on uh, Amazon EC2. And from there, uh, acted as a staging ground, if you like. From there, we pushed it into a couple of different places. We pushed it into Amazon DynamoDB, uh, which is a NoSQL data store, perfect for handling the sort of unstructured data that we were seeing coming from the sensor network. Uh, we also pushed it to S3 uh, for storage, where other people could access it. And from both of those sources, we could push it into a Hadoop cluster uh, for additional analytics. So that's it. We've picked up all the sensor modes. We're going to run around the entire conference center, and we've grabbed all our uh, hardware back. The data is already in the cloud. It's up in iDigi. We're going to pack the moats away in those crates over there, and then they're going to go into the warehouse ready for next time. The fact we're going to do this all again in Strata, California. We'll see you there. More and more of the data we need is out there. That makes big data a reality. 
a reality no one escapes from.